As we prepare to open God's Word together, let's ask Him to bless it to us. Let's pray. O Lord, Your Word is perfect, reviving the soul. Your testimony is sure, making the simple wise. Your precepts are right, rejoicing our hearts. Your commandments are pure, enlightening our eyes. The fear of You is clean, enduring forever. Your rules are true and righteous altogether. They are more to be desired than fine gold and sweeter than honey. By them your servants are warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Teach that word to us now by your Spirit, and show us Christ, we pray, for we ask in His name. Amen. Please be seated. And please turn with me in God's Word to the book of 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're going to read the first eight verses together. So verses 1 through 8 of First Thessalonians chapter 4, and let's pay careful attention, for this is God's own word. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus, that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Thus far, the reading of God's Word, may He bless it to us. Um, Have you ever wondered, what is God's will for my life? Uh, That's what I put as the title of the sermon, God's will for your life. Uh, Many people ask this question, um, and I'm going to tell you this morning what God's will for your life is. So if you've always wanted someone to answer that question, there's good news. Um, We're going to answer that question today. What is God's will for your life? Well, Paul says what God's will for your life is, your sanctification. Uh, Hopefully that's not a disappointing answer, um, because that is a wonderful thing to know that that is God's will for your life, that you be holy, that you be sanctified. Um, And that's the message of this passage. Um, And part of our job this morning will be to understand what that looks like in the Christian life. What does sanctification look like as God works it in us by His Holy Spirit? Um, And Paul is moving in this section of his letter from what he has been talking about of what they need to believe, uh, the doctrine of the letter, into what he often does is move from doctrine to talking then about ethics um, or how we are to live. Paul often proceeds this way in his letters. He explains to us the truth that we are to believe in Jesus Christ, and then he applies that truth to how we are to live. Um, And so this is very typical for him to start start with what it is that we should believe, our doctrine, and then move to ethics, how we are to live. Um, And maybe as as we were reading, you recognize that this passage deals with some rather sensitive subjects. Um, And whenever these kinds of subjects come up, it's difficult for pastors to know how exactly to speak about these things. I think sometimes parents of young children worry about how the pastor is going to speak about these things and these rather sensitive subjects. Um, and we do definitely do want to keep in mind that there are little ears listening and we want to be sensitive in these matters with our children. Uh, but we also need to keep in mind too, don't we, that the Lord Jesus knew when he gave these instructions that little children would be there to hear this in Thessalonica. And he knew that in time little children would be here to hear this in Santee. And so even though these things are dealing with sensitive subjects, they are important things for us to listen to God as He speaks to His people. Um, And these are subjects that we especially need to hear 
God's Word speak to, because if we don't talk about them and we never consider them, the only word that we'll ever hear is the world's word on these subjects. Um, And we know that the world loves to speak folly to the simple. Um, And the problem with woman folly is that she is loud and she is seductive and she knows nothing. Um, And that's what God's Word tells us. And so if that's the only voice that is speaking and God's truth is never speaking to these matters, we are sure to be led astray, both us and our little ones. And so God wants these things to be talked about in in an appropriate way. Uh, to be addressed as to the life we are to live before Him uh, for our good so that He might work in us which is that which is pleasing in His sight. And so as God brings the Word through Paul to them and through His Spirit to us, uh, what is God's will for our lives in Christ as we see it in these verses? Well, it's, it's very simple. God's will for us is that we would abound in holiness, that we would avoid impurity, and that we would abide in the Spirit. And that's how we want to think about this text together this morning, that we are to abound in holiness, that we are to avoid impurity, and that we are to abide in the Spirit. God's will for our lives is that we abound in holiness. Uh, Paul begins with general remarks in the first two verses about holiness and about God's will for our lives in these things. And what he begins to say in verses 1 and 2 will not only apply to what he has to say in verses 3 through 8, but will also apply to the next section that we'll consider Lord willing next time. Um, And so these are general remarks about sanctification, and then Paul is going to direct them in specific directions. Um, But he knows and he is calling on this people to continue to do what they are already doing. Uh, That's why Paul begins with these sort of words of entreaty, words of persuasion, Uh, not with, you know, hard commands or compelling authority, and that's because he's dealing with the people that are generally walking the way that they should. He says that, doesn't doesn't he? That you're, you're already doing what you should be doing, and that he's writing this so that they would do what they should be doing more and more. Um, And so this is not a church that is getting many things wrong in these areas. They're getting many things right in these areas, and Paul is encouraging them to keep walking in that direction. Um, And that's how his instruction is coming to them. As a faithful people, that he wants to abound in this faithfulness more and more. uh, That they would do it more and more. And we always need that in the Christian life. No matter how well we are going, we talked about this last time, didn't we? That no matter how well we're doing in the Christian life, there's always room for improvement. There's always more that we can be doing to serve the Lord. And we're to be encouraged to continue to walk in these things. Um, Paul says, I... we. We, you receive from us, in verse 1, how you ought to walk and to please God. Uh, in the Greek, it's a little stronger. This is the way ought means, really, it's the necessary way you must do this, how we must walk before our God if we are to please Him. Uh, Paul wants them to understand these things. He wants them to put them on more and more. And he, and he presses that point home to them by reminding them that this is the will of the Lord Jesus for their lives. Uh, Paul is not just giving his instructions for their lives, not just saying his opinions on how life ought to be lived. He's reminding them that his plea is really the Lord's plea, that his instructions are really the Lord's instructions, that if they want to know how to walk, uh, they have to follow these instructions. These are the Lord's marching orders, and that his will for their lives is that they would abound in holiness. Uh, His will for their lives is their sanctification. Uh, Sanctification involves that notion that we have been set apart, uh, that God has by His grace set us apart from uncleanness and from unrighteousness and consecrated us and dedicated us for service to Him. And Paul is reminding them of that from the very beginning, that we have been called to this, that it's God's will for us in Christ Jesus that we be sanctified, that we be holy, that we walk in the ways that are pleasing to Him, and that we abound in these things more and more. No matter how far we've come, there's always room to be better in pursuing holiness and seeking to abound in it. And so Paul wants God's people to abound in holiness. That's the Lord Jesus, His will for our lives is that we would abound in holiness. And one aspect of that that Paul wants us to understand is 
is that to abound in holiness, we must avoid impurity. Uh, Paul moves from this general principle about sanctification to talking about a particular area to apply it to sexual immorality. And again, he's not writing this to people who are getting it wrong. Um, Sometimes he will have to write things like this to people who are getting it very wrong. Um, It seems like this church has gotten it basically right, but Paul also knows as a good pastor that they live in a culture that is inundated and surrounded with pagan and Gentile views on this topic, Um, that they are inundated with the wrong kind of ethic when it comes to sexual morality and immorality. Um, And Paul is writing sensitive to that notion because attitudes in Greece were very lax and very very tolerant of these things uh, in ancient Greece. Um, It was widely believed that men either could not or would not limit themselves to their wives. Um, That's what one commentator said was just very common in the culture. Um, F.F. Bruce, another New Testament commentator, said, a man might have a mistress... The institution of slavery made it easy for him to have a concubine, while casual gratification was readily available from a harlot. The function of his wife was to manage his household and to be the mother of his legitimate children and heirs. Uh, Immorality was even part of the local religion in these areas. So even if they are not themselves walking in these things, Paul knows that these are the waters in which the church is swimming, um, that these attitudes and ideas are all around them. Uh, very lax, very tolerant, very much opposed to the ethics of the Lord. And we might observe at this point that the attitudes of first century Greece are not that much different than the attitudes of 21st century America uh, when it comes to these, these wild ideas. And Paul knew the church needed to continually be instructed about these things in his age, and the Holy Spirit knew that the church would continually need to be instructed about these things in every age. And so how does Paul address these things? Uh, Where should we begin if we want to address these things in a biblical way? Well, Paul begins with the knowledge of God. Um, You see that in verse 5. When Paul talks about this, he sort of locates the the real distinction in these ethics between those who do not know God and those who do. That if we really want to have a, a, a right starting point, we really have to begin with the knowledge of God. That that is what chiefly makes the difference about how we look at all kinds of areas of ethics, but particularly in this, in this area that Paul is addressing in this section. The Gentiles do not know God. And by implication, Paul is saying, but you do know God. And a knowledge of God should make all the difference in these things. A knowledge of God should make all the difference in these things. Um, It should make a radical difference. Because how do you see the world if you do not know God? Um, Well, if you don't know God, you think the world is whatever you decide to make of it. Uh, That you give the world its shape and its function. right? And so you can see how if you begin from that point, you don't know God and the world is what you make it, then male and female can cease to be divine creations and can simply become social constructs that you can change if you feel like it according to your own conception of being. Um, If you do not know God, you might think that sexuality is defined by your own wants and desires and not by what God says is right and proper. If you do not know God, then marriage becomes whatever you make it, not the institution that God has created and defined. Without a knowledge of God, Paul says, you have no sense that your body doesn't just belong to yourself. Um, but that it belongs to God. That radically changes things, doesn't it? If my life is mine to do whatever with it as I please, that's going to change how I live. A knowledge of God radically changes what we know. And those who don't know God will always do the same thing. They will seek to gratify themselves and their own desires. And Paul says we are not like that anymore. We have come to know God, and knowing God teaches us some important things about the world that we live in, that when it comes to gender and to sexuality and to marriage, those things are all created by Him and defined by Him. 
um, that we don't need to redefine these things to find our purpose in the world. Uh, you know, sadly, people, there are some people who think that they have to redefine these things to find their purpose in the world. And one of the real truths that, I, that I've come to treasure is what, from the Belgian Confession in its statement on God's creative work, when we read, He has given all creatures their being, their form and appearance, and their various functions for serving their Creator. That's so helpful because it reminds us that God knows what He's doing as a Creator God. If He's given us a gender, if He's given us a race, if He's given us a role, He knows that we can serve Him in that role He's given us. That we don't need to change those things about us to be able to serve Him. And that's a very comforting thing to know about the creative work of our God. That He has created us with our form and our appearance and our functions for serving our Creator. His, our being has been given us by Him. And that God made you to serve Him as you are. That you don't need to change yourself in order to serve Him. Uh, that's a wonderful thing to know about the world when we know that about the God that we serve. Um, it's a wonderful thing to know that our bodies don't belong to us, that they belong to Him. Uh, particularly those of us who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ can know that we've been purchased, that we've been bought with a price, um, that our body is not just our own by virtue of God's creating it, but by virtue of God's redeeming it in Christ that's been bought with a price. It's not ours to do with whatever we want. It's actually our responsibility to do with our bodies what God wants us to do with them, that He determines what's right and wrong. And that's true whether it's done in the privacy of our own homes or anywhere else. God is the one who determines what we are to do. So Paul says the knowledge of God is fundamental to getting these things right, uh, to choosing to serve God by who we are instead of serving ourselves. And what, what does God have to say about keeping our bodies holy and avoiding impurity? Well, quite a lot if you survey everything the Bible has to say about this. Uh, maybe you're afraid I'm going to do that this morning. I'm not. I'm going to limit myself to what Paul has to say here um, because this is enough for us to come to terms with this morning. Uh, but as I thought about this, I thought it might be helpful to use a biblical example as, a, as an analogy to draw from um, as we think about these things. And I thought a biblical analogy that might be helpful is to think back to the instructions that Moses delivered about tabernacle worship and specifically some of the things that he said about the incense that was to be offered in the tabernacle. Uh, Moses talks about this in Exodus 30, verses 34 and following. Um, but there we read about this incense, and God is very specific about the incense that's to be used in the temple, the incense that's to be used in the tabernacle. Um, it's only to be used by certain people. It's only to be used by the priests. It's only to be used in a certain place. Uh, in the tabernacle. It's to be put together according to a certain recipe. God's specific about how this, how this incense is to be made. Um, and God says that when this incense is properly used by the right people in the right place, according to the right recipe, then it's a, a pleasing aroma in His sight. It's a good thing, um, and it's pleasing to Him. But it's deadly to be used by the wrong people. And it's deadly to be used in the wrong place. And God said, if you don't follow the recipe, that's deadly. Or if you make this incense and then use it for some other purpose, that's deadly. And Nahab and Abihu found out how deadly it was to offer this strange fire. Not according to the word that God had given. And I think that's a good analogy for us to say the same thing is true when God talks about sexual behavior. That when it's used by the right people in the right place, according to the right recipe that God gives in these passages, then it's a good thing. It's holy and pleasing in God's sight. We don't have to think of it as something ugly or wrong. But if it's used outside of those parameters, um, then it is something that is, that is awful in His sight. And so what is the, the recipe in the sense that God wants this, this done by? Um, what is he talking about here? 
Well, he says, you know, these physical aspects of, of love are only good and holy if used by the right people. A husband and wife with one man and one woman in a marriage in a certain place within the bounds of that marriage. And according to the recipe we see in verses 4 and 5. Uh, what does Paul say that are very important here? That each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. And I think it's really crucial for us to see this as applying not just outside of marriage, but inside of marriage. This applies to all Christians regardless of their condition in the world. Married or single, inside or outside of a marriage relationship. Verse 4 essentially means to gain mastery over your sexual life. That's what it means to control your body. And to do so in holiness and in honor. This is the second time Paul's used the word holiness here. Um, again, meaning consecrated, dedicated uh, for service. Um, and not just in holiness, but he says here also in honor. Um, that we treat it as something valuable. Uh, when you have something that you treat as valuable, you, you treat it with the dignity it deserves. Um, and our bodies are valuable. Uh, God did not just come to redeem our souls, did He? He came and sent His Son to redeem us body and soul. Not only did He make our bodies, but He redeemed our bodies. And that shows the honor that we should attach to them. And this attitude is contrasted with the pagan attitude, the Gentile attitude here, the passion of lust. And what is the chief difference that it comes down to? Um, I think it's this, that Gentile lust is all about selfishly gratifying your own desires at the expense of another person. Whereas love is the unselfish desire to love and to cherish and to respect your neighbor for their sake and ultimately for God's sake. You see that fundamental difference? Uh, rather than seeking to gratify yourself, you're seeking to unselfishly love someone else. I think that's the, the chief difference that Paul is pointing out here. And that's why this has application whether you're single or whether you're married. This is what God's will is for all of our lives, right? And so single people do this by remaining chaste and celibate. That's how we show our love for God and our love for our neighbor. That's how we honor and hold our own bodies in holiness, um, and that's how we don't abuse our neighbor, right? Verse 6 talks about that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, that it's a sin against our own bodies, but it's also a sin against our brothers and our sisters to misuse these things. Uh, we're doing what God forbids if we don't respect these things. And so single people are to do it that way. Uh, how do married people do this? Well, certainly it's to, it's to refrain from anything outside of the bounds of marriage. That certainly is contained um, in verse 6. But also by treating your spouse with that kind of selfish, uh, selfless love. Um, I'm not telling you husbands and wives to go home and be selfish. That's, I'm, that was a misstatement. That's not what I want you to go do. What, is, what does Paul say here? There should be selflessness in marriage. Um, that that is to typify the aspects of marriage, even, even the physical aspects of marriage. That lust and the kind of lust that Paul is talking about outside of marriage is just as wrong inside of marriage. Um, John Stott rightly pointed out that marriage is not a form of legalized lust. Marriage does not exist simply to let us gratify our own desires. Um, and, it, and it's sad that you will find people, counselors talk about this all the time, where abuse is happening even inside of a marriage because husbands and wives are being used uh, by their spouses. It's a very sad thing. Even in marriage, people are to act honorably towards their neighbors. Even in marriage, we are called to master our own bodies and our desires, to hold ourselves in holiness and honor, and to treat our spouses in holiness and honor. Um, this is not a, a, an issue for abuse, and we're not to bring the world's twisted ideas um, about these things into the marriage relationship. It was meant to be a picture of the way Christ loves the church. 
Um, and we should strive to see that in our marriages, to see the kinds of love and cherishing and respect that Christ has for his bride. And we're warned very solemnly here by the Apostle Paul that if we will not respect the boundaries that God has set, we will have to reckon with Jesus Christ as a just avenger of those who wrong one another in these matters. The weak and the exploited have an advocate and an avenger. And he is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Paul warns about in verse 6. No one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter because the Lord is an avenger in all these things. As we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. As we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. Um, the weak and exploited have a protector. They have an avenger, even the Lord Himself. And the Lord Jesus sees what is done to the weak and to the exploited. Um, and He will see that justice is done for them. And that's an encouragement as we think about those who are trafficked and prostitutes and porn stars and abused people, um, that God is an avenger. I mean, God's people are to be reminded of that, right? This is a warning that comes to God's people, that the Lord is an avenger. And so we are not to be those who take advantage of our neighbor in thought, in word, in deed, in cyberspace, or in reality, that we not be among these people. We are solemnly warned by the Lord in His Word. Um, and if any of us are guilty of any of these sins, we must cease to do them, and we must seek the Lord Jesus in repentance as a forgiving Savior, lest we meet Him as a just avenger. Uh, that's the solemn warning that comes. But of course, God's Word doesn't just come to warn us, but to remind us that God's will for our lives is not just that we avoid this impurity, but that we abide in the Spirit. The passage ends with a powerful reminder to all of us in verses 7 and 8 about abiding in the Holy Spirit. And the first thing we are called to do is to remember the Spirit's calling. That we have not been called to impurity, but that we are called in holiness. This is the third time the word holiness has appeared. God's will for your life is holiness. You're to conduct yourself in holiness. And your calling is holiness. We're to remember that about our calling in the Spirit. Is that our calling is to holiness. We are called to dedicate, dedicate and consecrate ourselves to our God in our daily lives. So Paul calls us to abide in the Spirit by reminding us of the Spirit's calling in the first place. Secondly, he reminds us to abide in the Spirit by remembering the Spirit's Word. By remembering the Spirit's Word. Now, the world does not like to listen to God's Word regarding these matters. Um, we like to set our own ideas for these things and march to the beat of our own drum. The world prefers to say to God, my body, my choice in all sorts of ways. Um, but Paul is reminding us here that this is the word of the Spirit, that our bodies belong to God and are to be used as God sees fit, and the choice is not ours. The choice is really between God's good pleasure and God's just wrath. And so we're to remember that this word is not just the word of men, but it is the word of God. That's why verse 8 says, Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his spirit to you. We're to remember the spirit's calling. We're to remember the spirit's word and to abide in him. And finally, we're to remember the spirit's presence. We're to remember the spirit's presence. The Holy Spirit has been given to us. Um, and that's really where we find the hope in this passage. Um, because we all transgress these things in many ways. Whenever God comes to us and, 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 and portrays for us the marching orders we have as Christians, all the duties that are ours and they're laid before us, <clears throat> we can suddenly begin to think, how are we going to possibly do all the things that God is requiring of us? How are we possibly going to live up to these standards? 
And the encouragement that comes to you, Christian, is that the Holy Spirit has been given to you. The Holy Spirit has been given to you. <coughs> he dwells in you, and you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And so on the one hand, that means that you do not defile the temple that's been given to us, but on the other hand, that's a comfort to us. <coughs> Excuse me. A comfort to know that the Holy Spirit has been given to us. Because there's many ways for us to fail to keep God's law in these matters and every other matter about sanctification. <clears throat> but it's good for us to remember that we have a helper who is sanctifying us. We have a helper who is sanctifying us. <clears throat> and I want to end there because if you've been convicted this morning by God's law according to your sin, that's because He sent His Spirit to help you. He sent His Spirit to convict you, to expose your sin that He might turn you into the arms of your Savior. <coughs> Excuse me. The Holy Spirit's convicting work is never to expose us and leave us helpless. He always exposes our sin that He might turn us into the arms of our Savior, that we might find forgiveness and relief in Him. And that's a great comfort, comfort to know. That yes, it's true, if we don't repent, if we don't turn, we will meet the Lord Jesus as a just avenger. But that the Holy Spirit comes to us in this way so that we might not greet the Lord in the day of His coming as an avenger, but might greet Him now as a forgiving Savior who will help His people and restore His people, who will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of our unrighteousness and dedicate us again to His service and His purity. God's will for your life is to be holy in body and in soul. And we are to abound in the things that please Him, to avoid and abstain from the sin that so easily entangles us, and to abide in His Spirit, who will guide us into all truth. May we all believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and walk in a manner pleasing to God and abound in it more and more by His help. Amen. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we've heard difficult words this morning about uh, the world in which we live and our calling as Christians, and we recognize that each of us sins against your law in this regard in many ways, in thought and word and in deed. We pray that you would forgive us our sins and that where we are doing well, we would abound more and more. Where we are transgressing your law, that we would turn from the evil that we are doing and that we would turn and seek you as a Savior. May we take these solemn warnings that you have given to us as warnings for our good, that we might not see the judgment, but that we might turn from our sins and live. And so Lord, we pray that we would pursue that will that you have for our lives, our, our sanctification, our holiness, that we might remember the help that we have from the Holy Spirit and be comforted by His presence, that we might seek your face and His help, uh, that we might turn from these things and live. Thank you for what you are doing in us, cleansing us from our impurity, consecrating us to your service. Thank you for making us a temple for the Holy Spirit. May we abound in the things that please you more and more. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.